So I'd like to spend the next hour talking about these remarkable deposits called cap carbonates, which sit sharply and directly upon cryogenian glacial deposits globally and are unique to cryogenian glacial deposits. You do not see these carbonates in younger or most older uh, glaciations. And uh, not only are they unique uh, and a deposit for which the snowball earth theory provides a very simple and elegant explanation, but they also give us a geochemical and isotopic record of the snowball deglaciation and its aftermath, or the, the deglaciation and its aftermath. Okay. And so uh, it's in the cap carbonates that we have the record of the extreme carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, which are a prediction of the snowball earth hypothesis and only of the snowball earth hypothesis, because if you have much less ice than that, if you have large areas of open water, then you don't need nearly as much CO2 to deglaciate. So uh, these are two examples of what the uh, cap carbonates uh, uh, typically look like at their base. So this is the Sturdian cap carbonate in uh, Western Mongolia. Um, Francis McDonald for scale, pointing to the knife sharp contact um, between a stratified uh, diamictite with lots of ice rafted drop stones and this organic rich limestone that directly overlies it. And here in Namibia, the Maranoan cap carbonate being pointed to by Galen Halverson, um, where the terminal glacial deposits loaded with ice rafted debris are directly overlain by a peloil, uh, low angle cross stratified, uh, pale colored dolostone in which uh, direct evidence of ice or drop stones are totally lacking. And uh, although it was originally thought that these might represent hiatuses, gaps in the stratigraphic record. When you look at them at the centimeter scale, or the thin section scale, there seems to be continuous uh, deposition. And moreover, this relationship is, is seen regionally. In fact, the cap carbonates are much more continuous and, exten and extensive than the glacial deposits themselves. The cap carbonates typically extend far beyond the limits of the actual glacial deposits. So because you see the same relationship over such vast areas and almost everywhere, it's hard to imagine that it could represent a hiatus everywhere. So this is a sort of generalized depiction of the Sturdian and Maranoan cap carbonates um, in a sort of sequence stratigraphic framework. So here are the glacial deposits shown in, in this case with uh, an incised valley fill. And, um, uh, typically, uh, these represent a single depositional sequence, which can be of great thickness uh, scale here, um, and without parasequences. So this seems to be a single depositional sequence. In other words, a, a large water depth that was created probably by tectonic subsidence during the long glaciation without much sedimentation, and then that rapidly fills in. Uh, it's long been noted that there is, is a, a difference between the Sturdian and the Maranoan uh, glacial sequences in that the Maranoan has a pale dolomite at the base which has a lot of shallow water indicators, including stromatolites and wave ripples and low angle cross stratification, uh, suggesting shallow water and therefore a transgressive tract in sequence stratigraphic terminology. In other words, uh, a shallow water deposition which tracks a large, uh, large magnitude rise in sea level, which naturally you expect because of the rapid ice melting. Whereas this uh, shallow water uh, transgressive tract is generally absent in Sturdian glacial deposits, although just a few days ago I saw the best one I've ever seen, and that's the Sturdian uh, cap uh, dolomite at Arcarula um, in the Flinders Ranges. And uh, there in uh, Kingsmill Creek, uh, the Sturdian cap dolomite is uh, exceptionally well developed and in fact is at least as well developed as the Maranoan one is in that area. And uh, Marie Corcoran, as some of you in the audience may know, actually was the one we suge who suggested we go and look at that cap. I'm great, very grateful for her. Um, we actually uh, saw her in uh, Arcarula. Uh, there are a number of very unusual sedimentary structures that are associated, particularly with the Maranoan cap dolomite, including tube stone stromatolite, giant wave ripples, seafloor barite, 
uh, seafloor, aragonite cements. I won't have time to discuss all of these. If anyone is interested in them, we can talk about it uh, later. I will briefly show you some photographs. So here are some photographs from the uh, Sturdian cap carbonate in Namibia, um, as shown in the previous diagram. You, in the Sturdian, you usually go directly into the deepest water facies, and then you shoal upwards from there. Um, so this transgressive tract is, is missing. But the high stand has lots of unusual uh, microbial uh, structures in it. Um, yeah. So the Maranoan one uh, has, uh, is better developed, more completely developed, and has a, a number of unusual structures. Sheet crack cements, these are horizontal cracks that open and get filled with cement. Um, I, th I think that that's because of fluid overpressure developed in the sediment, and I suspect that's because of a very large initial rapid sea level fall, which occurs as, as an ice sheet retreats. You lose the gravitational interaction between the ice sheet and the seawater. So if the Greenland ice sheet melts tonight, sea level around Greenland will have fallen by about 100 meters, despite the fact that global sea level will have risen by two and a half meters. Around Greenland, there will be a 100 meter sea level fall. And that's because today, the sea level is drawn up by the gravitational attraction of the Greenland ice sheet. And when that disappears, sea level drops instantaneously, or at least as fast as the ice melts. So if the ice really <laughs> melts or retreats rapidly, you, you get a, 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 an instantaneous um, uh, fall in sea level, which I think is what leads to these uh, pore fluid overpressures. Uh, giant wave ripples. Uh, these are well developed in the Capitolomite in Australia and many other places. They're on, on Lee's paleogeography, they're always meridional, north-south in orientation. They're, none of them are east-west. It looks like these are waves generated by trade winds, but they're unusually large and steep because the trade winds had long per wave period. These are structures formed in relatively deep water, in the mixed layer, but maybe 60, 80 meters depth under winds that instead of being seven meters per second, like today's trade winds, are more like 20 meters per second. And so you get long period waves, the only waves filling the bottom. So you build up these very large waveforms. This is from uh, uh, numerical calculations. Um, it suggests that, that, that suggests that trade winds are spinning up. And uh, uh, no atmospheric dynamicist yet has really taken this on as a challenge. But one suggestion is that as the ice is retreating, through the mid-latitudes, you have very strong temperature and therefore pressure contrast. And the Hadley cells actually spin up for a while and produce these bed forms. Uh, tubestone stromatolite, uh, these are either small or large stromatolite that have tubes in them that are actually little infills <coughs> of sediment, but the, the, they're, they're circular and the stromatolites form a sort of an egg carton. And it looks like when they're growing, the stromatolite had these little circular pits, like pits on a golf ball. I don't know why they do it that way, except golf balls, obviously, they put those pits in it for aerodynamic reasons. I don't know whether this has something to do with uh, the unusually you know, high turbulent environment you would expect as the ice is retreating or what. These are always in the paleo vertical. So I, I, I don't think we really have a good explanation for this. The, but these are unique to the Maranoan uh, cap dolomite, and these tubestone stromatolites occur in a number of areas. The ones in Death Valley are almost indistinguishable from the ones we have in Namibia. And then seafloor uh, sea cements. We have up to 100 meters of these aragonitic uh, seafloor cements. It's like a return to the Paleoproterozoic of the Archean. So obviously we're in a very highly oversaturated situation where there's carbonate production even on, on the sea floor, uh, abiotic carbonate production. You see this rarely in the Phanerozoics, like in the early Triassic. But these are massive, these are the thicknesses of this stuff. And uh, so that's a very unusual state of, uh, of, of uh, oversaturation with respect to carbonate in the, in the sea floor at that time. I suspect this has to do with ocean warming. And one of the uh, key things about the Maranoan cap dolomites is that uh, very commonly they have barite, barium sulfate, either as an orthogenic mineral, as here in West Africa, or as seafloor cements. So this is a layer that you can tra track in the Mackenzie Mountains in northwest Canada for 150 kilometers along strike, 
And these things look like corals. They have growth laminae in them, but they're actually rosettes of barite. And you can demonstrate that they were growing, projecting up into the water column on the seafloor, because you can see the peloidal dolomite, actually very brown, probably from manganese or iron, that's filling in between them. And there are little bridges of barite going across. So you can tell that these are actually growing up in the water column. So barite is redox sensitive. Okay, you can dissolve lots of barium in, in reduced waters, but as soon as you have any sulfate, uh, the barite crashes out because barium, barium sulfate is, is extremely insoluble in, uh, in oxygenated water. So this is a redox front in the water column. And they always occur right at the contact between the dolomite and the overlying limestone. As you go from mixed layer deposition below, that's deposition above uh, uh, wave base, to deposition below wave base above. And so that looks like that's a redox boundary. Uh, I, I, there's nothing like this at any other time in the record that I know of, certainly not in the Phanerozoic. Uh, barite coming out. It's just one layer, is it? One layer, up to eight centimeters thick. That's right. Only a singular layer, right at that. In the last dolomite, and, and characteristically goes this dark color. Yeah. And, and here you can see the aragonite fans that are growing right off the tips of the last barite. Okay, just here are some examples of marino and cap dolomites in various parts. This is Death Valley, southwestern U.S. This is in McKenzie Mountains, northwestern Canada, geologists for scale. Uh, King Island in Tasmania. This is the Cotton's Breccia, the cap dolomite. Um, this one now has now been dated, 635, just like the South China and Namibia. And this is South Australia, Alatna Gorge, or Alatna Creek, rather. Okay. This is East Greenland in the Tillite Clift uh, in the fjord region of East Greenland. This is in the Zafgan Basin in Western Mongolia, some geologists for scale. This is the glacial sequence. That's the cap dolomite. Um, northwestern China, Xinjiang province, thanks to Xu Haixiao, um, Mauritania in West Africa, a lot of desert varnish here, but that's the glacial, you can see stones here, cap dolomite. Uh, the cap dolomite, um, which I'm going to argue is the part that was actually deposited as the ice was melting, okay, that's the mixed layer deposit, the shallow water deposit that's tracking the sea level as it's rising and flooding the landscape, because remember we're talking to a, of, a, of a global sea level rise, uh, the sea level rise at global average amplitude of up to a kilometer, depending on how much ice is actually left at the deglaciation. Um, the cap dolomite does actually thicken as a relationship with paleo latitude. Uh, these are paleo latitudes from Lee's paleogeography. Okay, so more support for the paleogeography. At least the upper envelope of thickness is increased towards the equator, as you would expect, not only because the water should be warmer here, and so therefore the carbonate saturation should be higher, but also as the ice is retreating from the equator towards the poles, there'll be more time and you, uh, for it to be deposited, and you'll see more of the sea level rise at low latitude, um, because, of course, the cap dolomite doesn't form until you've deglaciated locally. No high latitude continents. Okay. Uh, both of the cap carbonates are associated with negative carbon isotope excursions. I'll say more, more about that a little bit later. And um, the presence of cap carbonates uh, stems from this hysteresis in CO2. So as you build up CO2 in the atmosphere, okay, by one, two, three orders of magnitude, um, CO2 is an acid in contact with water, so the ocean is becoming more acidic. Just like the modern ocean is becoming more acidic, and just like your stomach becomes more acidic if you have, uh, uh, if you have a tummy ache. And uh, if you have an uh, acid stomach, what you do is you eat some pills. And uh, th those pills they used to be called bufferin because they're buffering the acidity. All they are are ground up calcium carbonate. Okay, it's just limestone ground up fine, and you have them, and that buffers the acidity because when that calcium carbonate d dissolves, it takes up the CO2 and converts it into bicarbonate. Now, if you ever have acid indigestion, you, you, know, you know a couple things about it. First of all, uh, you have to take quite a few pills. And uh, second of all, you don't feel better right away. And third of all, even when you feel better, you don't feel 100% better. 
Okay, and the ocean is exactly like that. Uh, you've got to dissolve a lot of carbonate. You've got to take a lot of pills. And it takes a while. And uh, even, you know, when, when all the buffering is complete, you still have residual acidification, but not as much as it would have been if you hadn't taken any pills. So this is a plot of alkalinity versus calcium ion concentration, both as log scales. This is uh, present-day seawater. Okay, and here's where we are, this is, well, pre-industrial. And if you raise the carbon dioxide concentration to a tenth of a bar, 100,000 ppm, which is about what is required in models to deglaciate, what happens is you go from here to here as a result of carbonate dissolution. In other words, the pills are dissolving in the ocean. In the modern ocean, it'll be coccolith ooze. You can think for a few minutes about what the source of that carbonate is going to be in the, in the cryogenian ocean. Okay? And you have to dissolve a lot of it. A lot of carbonate has to dissolve to buffer the acidification of the ocean under snowball conditions. To get an idea of how much, you can see that the alkalinity increase is about an order of magnitude, and the calcium ion increase is about a factor of five. So that's an enormous increase in the amount of calcium and carbonate that is dissolved in seawater as a result of the acidification that occurs during the snowball earth. Now, we assume that the seawater and the ocean are in equilibrium with respect to CO2 during the snowball, even though you have ice cover, because of the sea glacier flow, wherever you're at a continental margin, uh, there's shear. Because you have flowing ice in contact with land fast ice, and so you have shear, and so there'll be cracks. And those cracks, of course, will heal over with, with new sea ice, but they'll reform. So you'll always have cracks, and because of the very long time scale, the multi-million year time scale, even just diffusion through cracks will allow the ocean and atmosphere to be in equilibrium with respect to CO2, given the long time scale. People who know a lot about diffusion assure us that, that that's correct. And in any case, the CO2 is being pumped directly into the ocean by submarine volcanism, as well as into the atmosphere by subaerial volcanism. So it's actually not certain, certain that if they were isolated and you open it up, whether the ocean would outgas or ingas. Okay. Probably they're staying not, wouldn't be that good. But in any case, they're probably in equilibrium. What is the source of the, uh, of the carbonate? Because remember, we don't have any calcareous nanoplankton in the cryogenian. Well, of course, it's all those carbonate diamictites that the glaciers are pushing into the ocean the whole time. Because the glaciers that are glaciating carbonate platforms are moving debris and rock flour and dumping it into the ocean at the grounding line during the whole snowball earth, at least after the ice sheets become thick enough that they start to flow. So, so there's ample supply of alkalinity, of carbonate for dissolution. A uh, paper came out in Nature Geoscience earlier this year pointing out that as a, because of Rodinia breakup and sea level fall, uh, there would be really intense uh, seafloor weathering, and that would be an additional source of alkalinity. But just carbonate uh, erosion by the glaciers is probably adequate to maintain saturation of the ocean. Okay. Now, this is important for cap carbonates because when I first saw cap carbonates, I said, oh, th this is a problem for the snowball earth hypothesis because the ocean should be very acidic because of the high CO2. If you have acid, you should be dissolving carbonate, not precipitating it. And that was a big hurdle for me that Dan Schrag, geochemical oceanographer at Harvard, helped me get over. And the first point is that the ocean can be saturated at any uh, pH if you give it enough alkalinity. Okay, if you feed it enough, you know, carbonate that it can dissolve, it will dissolve until it, you have a, a saturation of unity. You still then have to push it to critical oversaturation to produce carbonate. But, of course, when you deglaciate, the ocean abruptly warms up, goes from minus 4 degrees to, you know, probably minus 40, plus 40 degrees. And, of course, that, you know, that has a huge impact on carbonate saturation. That drives the carbonate saturation up. And then you've got this intense silicate weathering. So pH is rising, and that's also driving the saturation up. So all that carbonate that dissolved over those tens of millions of years during the glaciation all comes out. 
and that's the cap carbonate. Okay. So the cap carbonate is a direct consequence of the ocean acidification. So it's, it's such a simple and, uh, and direct and elegant way of explaining uh, cap carbonates and why they only occur after snowball events, not other, uh, not, not partial glaciations. <clears throat> so there's the source of the, uh, of the carbonate. Uh, that's the diamictite. And probably even more important source is all that fine suspended rock flour, uh, much of which is carbonate. Uh, where the glaciers were acting in carbon, because that's highly reactive. That will do, that's like your, your pills. The, the, the pills are, the only thing special about the pills, as opposed to chumping on limestone, is it's finely, finely ground, militarized. Okay, so there, there's the source of the carbonate, the, uh, the, the debris and the, and the plume. That's the cap carbonate which has the two stages in it. This is the transgressive part, the part that, tra that, that tracks the sea level rise. And then this is the high stand that fills back up to sea level in, uh, in platformal areas to fill in the accommodation space that was created by the tectonic subsidence during the long glaciation when the sedimentation rates, remember, were very, very low. And so you had a lot of tectonic subsidence and so you had a lot of accommodation. So you had you know, if the glaciation was short-lived, the sea level would fall, and then it would come back, just come back up to where it was before. But because it's long-lived, the sea level falls, and get tectonic substance, so when you come back up, now you've got some place to put sediment, and then when you add in sediment loading, you know, 120 meters of uh, water, you know, ends up being 400 meters of sediment. Note that the glacial deposits are down the slope, not on the shelf. Um, where uh, it, was, it was mainly above sea level, just little bits of lodgement till, but it's actually on the shelf where the cap carbonate tends to be best developed. <clears throat> okay, snowball deglaciation is extremely rapid. And, and, and these are the principal reasons why that's true, why uh, the deglaciation must be rapid. There have been some geologists, uh, paleomagnetists have argued that it's very slow, because there's evidence for something that looks like magnetic polarity reversals uh, in a couple of the cap dolomites. And uh, modern uh, polarity reversals, you have to reverse the inner core, which is solid, and so therefore it has to be a diffusive process. And so therefore, uh, it, the, the duration of a true reversal is probably something on the order of 7,000 years. I think that's a good estimate for the last one, the Brunish Marijana. Uh, right now, there's a revolution going on in, uh, in geomagnetism because uh, of some uh, new experimental data that suggests the inner core may have actually formed much later in Earth history than we previously thought. Um, but it remains to be seen why exactly there are things that look like reversals. But in any case, uh, although there have been geological arguments for slow, slow deglaciation, uh, there's a real consensus among the climate dynamics community that it must be fast. So here are the reasons. Uh, the first uh, thing is the, is the ice elevation feedback. Okay, as you melt down an ice sheet, as it melts down, it goes to lower and lower elevation, the surface, and therefore it's descending into warmer and warmer air. And that makes it melt faster and faster the lower it gets. So that's a positive feedback. Okay. Second is the ice albedo feedback. As the ice sheets shrink, they expose more dark water or darker land. That absorbs more sunlight, so that causes more melting. So it's a, once again, it's a positive feedback, a feedback that's driving the process faster, not a feedback that's good. <laughs> there are a lot of press people who think a positive feedback is a good thing and a negative feedback is a bad thing. <laughs> we, we're not doing our, our job very well, I think. Okay, ocean stratification feedback. This is a very important one. Um, when you warm uh, the ocean, the liquid ocean, uh, you're creating a more stable stratification because you're making low-density low warm water at the surface. And so that makes it harder to, to, to mix up colder water and, and, and absorb heat. And so the atmosphere warms faster if the ocean is better stratified. So as you're warming, you're, you're, you're imposing a more stable stratification on the ocean, which means that the ocean has a lower heat capacity, meaning that more of the heating goes into the atmosphere. Okay, it's exactly the converse of what has happened during the pause in global warming. 
because uh, we were upwelling so much cold water that the, the ocean was taking up more heat, so the atmosphere wasn't feeling it. The Earth was got, still getting hotter over the last 15 years, but the atmosphere wasn't. <clears throat> so that's an important one. Greenhouse gas temperature feedback. Obviously, as you warm the ocean, uh, the solubility of many ga greenhouse gases, including CO2, decreases. So the ocean degasses. So that also makes it warmer. Um, I saw this as the outgassing feedback. That's the idea that subaerial volcanism increases when you deglaciate because you're decompressing uh, all the magma chambers. And this is observed in the, uh, in the, in the uh, last uh, deglaciation uh, that you get an increase in magma production in Iceland, for example. You can see this uh, geochemically. And of course, this is a huge factor, and that is most of our ice sheets are at low latitude. So they're under intense uh, uh, solar forcing. So they're going to they're going to melt fast. You know, the 10,000 years for these were these are you know subpolar ice sheets, the Laurentide and Scandinavian ice sheets. These things are all down in the low latitude. Okay, so now this uh, the fast deglaciation uh, has some important consequences, and this is one of them. So I did some estimates of the meltwater production rate. So if you assume uh, I think I hear, I, I assume the meltwater, if the, if the ice sheet melting, that's globally, is, occurs in 2,000 years, if you had a two kilometer average ice sheet thickness above sea level, that's the thickness of the uh, East Antarctic ice sheet, the mean thickness, so that's the, the, the volume of ice. If you melt that in 2,000 years, the meltwater production rate is over 30 spheredrops. That's 30 times present runoff. Uh, probably this estimate is too high, but let's take it by half. Then we have 16 sphere drifts. That's still really big. 16 times modern runoff. Uh, and actually, the 32 increases to 40 if you include the sea glacier, which of course you must. So the meltwater production rates are enormous. And uh, there's no way that the ocean can, uh, can accommodate that. Because the Snowball Ocean is, is a cold brine very high density, and, and you're flooding it with meltwater, which has a very low density, and moreover, it's being intensely heated by the greenhouse atmosphere. So you're producing the most stably stratified ocean that has ever existed. Essentially, we're putting a lake on top of the ocean, so I call this glacial Lake Harland. It also changes a lot of things about, for example, the Capdolomite. Because it means the cap dolomite is not a marine deposit. It's a lacustrine deposit. It's being precipitated more or less out of fresh meltwater. So that changes a lot of things about, uh, and including the problem of why it's dolomite in the first place. Because if the Snowball Ocean wasn't receiving very much continental weathering, but was going undergoing hydrothermal exchange, um, you would have expected it should have a very low magnesium-calcium ratio because seafloor uh, alteration is a sink for magnesium and a source of calcium. So it was surprising to me that the cap dolomite was al always dolomite. And in fact, it's much easier to make dolomite if it's non-marine. We heard an interesting talk and had a very interesting field trip with Tom Gernon, uh, Irish geochemist at Southampton University, who pointed out that if there was a lot of hyaloclastite glass in the seafloor, which there might be because of high temperature and reduced pressure, actually that isn't a sink for magnesium. But I don't think that this was deposited from the Snowball Ocean in any case. I think it came out of the meltwater lid. And remember, our redox boundary is there, which means we had intermediate water that was anoxic, not because it was snowball water, but because it was driven to anoxia, probably by high surface productivity because of all the nutrients from the strong erosion and all the nutrients that weren't being used during the glaciation. Okay, so the only uh, ordered dolomite that I know of forming at low temperature in the world today um, is something called Bemidji-type dolomite, and it occurs at a waste dump site in northern Minnesota. And there's a bunch of oil that was spilled there. And uh, they've been studying the water, and this is pretty, uh, this is, you know, six degree water, low magnesium calcium ratio, low ionic strength, and basically fresh water, low sulfate, quite acidic groundwater. 
And under the influence of, of archaeal methanogenesis, there are three uh, re reactions going on, dissimilatory iron reduction and, and two types of methanogenesis, um, one of which is a sink for CO2 and the other two are, are drivers of alkalinity, um, ordered dolomite is forming at six degrees, uh, both in nature and in the laboratory using the same, these same waters. I, I love this because <laughs> this water is a good description of, of glacial Lake Harland water. Okay, so uh, I don't think this is a marine deposit, and that's one of the reasons why it uh, has a lot of strange geochemical features. <clears throat> it definitely was deposited in shallow water because it's typically uh, peloidal, uh, well sorted. In fact, the lamination, it's almost always present in the cap dolomite, that's a transgressive tract in the Marino and cap dolomite, is full of these low angle cross stratification. So it's obviously deposited as a, a coarse silt to coarse sand and granules. You can see this peloidal texture, which is, which is present in most capped dolomites that aren't too recrystallized. And so that means it's a shallow water deposit, and yet it's draped over you know, large uh, paleo relief features and also extends over uh, great distances across strike, uh, suggesting it formed at, at very different elevations. Oh, another reason for thinking this shallow water is it's full of stromatolites in many sections. So that means that when sea level was low, okay, there's a period of rising sea level as the ice is melting. While sea level was low, you're producing shallow water deposits on the forest slope. Our platform in Namibia must have been subaerial exposed. And on the platform, when sea level was low, and we were forming the dolomite here, this should have been way below wave base. And because we have wave-generated structures and evidence of photic zone, both here and both here and here, that means, can only mean one thing to anyone who's taken the course called the Stratigraphy 101 that used to be taught everywhere and is taught almost nowhere now, one of the most important courses in geology, that means that, that those deposits have to be diachronous, not of the same age. So that means that down here, these deposits must be older than these deposits despite the fact they're lithologically the same and they're completely continuous. So it, it turns out we can test that because um, one thing that was noticed in almost all uh, capped dolomites is that they get isotopically lighter. So this is carbon uh, delta C13. They get isotopically lighter up section. And so I did a little experiment. I said if they're really diachronous, then the, the deposits that are, that are down in the basin and on the slope should be older than the ones up here on the platform. Okay, because these ones down here would be deposited when sea level was here, and these are deposited when sea level's up here. All right, so these would be older and these were younger. If all of these show this isotopic trend from, from, from heavier to lighter, then these down here should be even heavier. And so I just did a bunch of high-resolution sections. There's only a few meters thick. And look, the platform ones are all ranged from about minus two and a half to minus five, and they're all concave downwards. The deeper ones down on, on the deeper four slope begin around zero per mil and go to minus two and a half, and they're all concave upwards. So they have different isotopic compositions and, and, and a different form, and this one looks like it fits right between here and here, and this is in the, on the upper slope. So we can plot these all in one diagram. So here are the four slope ones, here are the platformal ones, okay? And they all fall on this continuous sort of uh, uh, sigmoidal curve, uh, consistent with this being a change over time in the isotopic composition. And these are older and these are younger, and this one in here is in, on the upper slope is in between. So that was a very good test of, uh, of, the, of the idea that they're diachronous. Okay? But more importantly than ha having it being a test, it presented two really serious problems. Okay. And the first one is that the overall isotopic shift is nearly five per mil, from almost zero per mil here to almost five and a half, five per mil here. So let's call it a four per mil shift. 
So there is no way you can change the isotopic composition of the ocean by four per mil in 1,000 years or 10,000 years because the residence time of carbon in the ocean atmosphere system today is 150,000 years. And at this time, it was probably order of magnitude minimum higher. So there is no way that the carbon isotopes could shift, the composition of the water could shift in carbon on such a ta short time scale, even if it was just the mixed layer. So that means there has to be some other explanation for this, for this very systematic shift. Um, and the second problem is that in this part of the curve here, where it looks like the, you should be isochronous, where these sections seem to fit together, there's a gradient. A systematic gradient from the inner part of the platform, which is isotopically lighter, and the outer part of the platform is isotopically heavier. And so what, what that, 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 that suggests there's a strong isotopic gradient in, in the water or something else. Okay. So we all know that uh, stable isotope equilibrium fractionation is temperature dependent. And that's why we use oxygen isotopes as a paleothermometer. You know, Harold Urey, who invented that, said, isn't it amazing that we can actually measure such an evanescent quality as temperature in the geological past? And that's what oxygen isotopes did for us. Uh, carbon isotope, isotope equilibrium fractionation is also temperature dependent. But in the modern ocean, uh, so this is a depiction of the, carbon, the speciation of carbon. That's the fraction of the, car, of the inorganic carbon that's locked up in various phases, like carbonate ion, bicarbonate ion, and CO2 either dissolved or CO2 gas. Okay, and, and this is the fraction. So in the modern ocean, most of the DIC, the dissolved inorganic carbonate, is in the form of bicarbonate. And the equilibrium fractionation between bicarbonate and carbonate is only one and a half per mil. Okay? So there is a temperature dependence, but it's so small that it, it basically it's, you can measure it, but it's probably not significant. It's probably about a tenth of a per mil for a very large temperature shift. So nobody uses carbon isotopes for, for paleothermometry. However, under very low pH conditions, which would be imposed by the high CO2, your, your pH is down here, and so most of the DIC is in the form of CO2. And between CO2 and carbonate, there's almost an 8 per mil fractionation, equilibrium fractionation. And that means the temperature dependence of that fractionation, the change in the fractionation with temperature, is significant. It can be up to a few per mil. And because 90% of the DIC is in the form of CO2, and only a tiny, tiny proportion is in the form of carbonate, if there is a change in the fractionation, that change will be entirely expressed in the carbonate, not in the CO2. because it's a tiny reservoir that's hanging way out there. And so to maintain a balance, remember the lever rule, you have to change the composition of it much more than that big heavy thing that's close to the pivot point. So it'll all be taken up in this. And that means that as the temperature goes up, associated with the deglaciation, the equilibrium fractionation get less, and that means that the, the carbon isotope composition of the carbonate ion gets lighter and lighter, which is exactly what we observe. Okay, so this would then be a warming. And the same effect can also explain this gradient. Because at the outer edge of the shelf, the water's colder because you've got cold intermediate water that's upwelling, and we have sedimentological evidence for upwelling. If we even know which hemisphere we're in, because the upwelling currents are turning left. The upwelling is bringing up colder water, so the outer shelf is colder. But you go into the interior of the shelf, you've got no cold water beneath you. You've got this CO2 greenhouse above you, and so that water gets hotter and hotter. Okay, so you have a beautiful explanation for this gradient. Now, quantitatively, 
to come up with four, four and a half per mil shift over time, and this gradient, which is um, uh, a, uh, a tenth of a per mil per kilometer, you can only do it if the pH is less than 7.2, meaning high CO2, and if the temperature change is on the order of 45 degrees or more. Okay? <laughs> so, of course, this would be ludicrous, 45 degree temperature change. This would be ludicrous in any situation other than snowball deglaciation. But for snowball deglaciation, that's, it, it's not, it's far from ludicrous, it's, it, it's inevitable if there was a snowball earth. So this is the Capitolomite. This is the high stand sequence in Namibia. There's lots of parasequences. This is one parasequence, 400 meters, then back to lots of parasequences again. Okay. That's the glacial surface. I, I didn't measure that section. <laughs> I just while we're there, though, <laughs> here's an interesting thing. Can, can you tolerate a little bit more carbon isotopes? <laughs> This is going to be stratigraphy 101 again. So here's what we were just talking about. This is the gradient across the shelf from the outer shelf to the inner shelf. Notice uh, for the high stand, <laughs> these things are going off all in different directions in carbon isotope composition, and the gradient is exactly the opposite. So this is the outer shelf, and this is the inner shelf. So the, so the gradient is reversed, but it's actually not a gradient. <laughs> I think this is actually just a reflection of diachronous deposition. So note that the, the top, which is the sequence bound, the top here, the, which is the sequence boundary at the top, that's where the, you finally fill back to sea level and you have exposure surface, no more deposition. Uh, it's very different compositions. So that suggests that it, you, you reach sea level at different times. And, and so if you consider the carbon isotopic composition up here, because this is actually after the CO2 has been largely drawn down, as being constant, you can, you can just draw timelines here of constant carbon isotope composition, and you would say in this outer platform, you've reached this level, whereas in the in, inner platform, you've only reached to this level. Okay? And so that's why I drew these lines like this. I call, I call those isochems, surfaces of constant isotope composition. And it suggests that the platform filled up at the rim and, and then progressively uh, filled backwards, uh, landward, from the rim inward. It's not unusual, actually. A lot of carbonate platforms do that. I don't know anyone's uh, demonstrated it so nicely with carbon isotopes. So. <clears throat> I must say, I did not know a single thing about stable isotope geochemistry when I started working on Snowball. I was told, because I went to a university which was very strong in stable isotopes, I was told two things. Go into stable isotopes, don't go into tectonics. I never took advice very well, so I went straight for tectonics because my university career started in 1960 and ended in 1968. That is precisely the plate tectonic revolution. So naturally, I went for tectonics. But I did, <laughs> I did get back to stable isotopes. But the, the, the thing about this hypothesis is that uh, it's got more arms than an octopus. And so to deal with it, you, you just have to get up to speed on all these other sciences, you know, atmosphere and ocean dynamics and stable isotopes, and we're going to talk about biology, the most difficult one. So that, that really is the power of, a, of an idea. Okay, so, so these cap carbonates, so this is now a treasure trove of, of isotopic and geochemical records of the snowball deglaciation and, its, and the greenhouse aftermath. Because carbonates are the most wonderful sediments, because not only are they different in every period in Earth history, but they have a record of the, of the chemistry of the ocean and, and, and more inferentially the atmosphere. Not a direct record, but proxy records. And so these are some of the main uh, workers in this area who've been using various isotopic systems uh, to test uh, this prediction that you should have very high CO2 in the snowball aftermath. You know, some of these people are Marcus Kunzmann, who was in Adelaide, uh, Galen Halverson here, Strontium in one of his many contributions, uh, John Higgins. Many, several of these people have actually been in, the, in, in Namibia with me, including Clara Butler. 
Okay, so I'm, I won't go into all of these. I think I have this one. I'm not sure whether I talk about uh, uh, the calcium isotope work of, uh, of Juan Silva. Uh, but let's talk about this triple oxygen, because I, I think that's a very interesting one. So this is Weiming Bao, who's at Louisiana State University. He uh, did his PhD at Princeton uh, with, uh, with Paul Koch and Dan Schrag. And then he did a postdoc at uh, Scripps with Mark Tiemens. And Mark Tiemens was the one who discovered uh, that mass-independent fractionations occur with some chemical reactions. Formerly, they were thought to be only products of nuclear processes. But Mark Tiemens uh, showed that uh, actually uh, chemical reactions in, in the stratosphere uh, uh, catalyzed uh, uh, by photolysis uh, actually drive strong mass-independent fractionations. That is, fractionations that deviate from mass dependence. So there are three isotopes of oxygen, oxygen-16, the common one, oxygen-17, and 18. And very few people measure 17, because it usually doesn't give you any additional information. And it's harder to measure the ratio of 17 to 16 than 18 to 16. And if you have mass-dependent fractionation, then the 17 is just half the 18, and so you don't learn anything. But with mass-independent fractionations, those are deviations from that mass-dependent. So you either have an excess of 17, or a deficiency of 17, rather, uh, relative to mass-dependent fractionations. And one is called a positive, the other a negative, and it's usually given a capital delta. So an excess of O17 is a cap delta O17 positive anomaly. <clears throat> so remember the barite. So um, barite is very important in this story because it's composed of barium sulfate, and sulfate is produced by oxidative weathering of sulfides in rocks, okay? Because most sedimentary igneous metamorphic rocks have, have a lot of sulfide and more reduced in the atmosphere. But under, under oxic weathering conditions, sulfate is produced and runs off into the, into the ocean. Now, it turns out that sulfate is an extremely strongly bonded molecule and does not exchange water with, uh, uh, oxygen with water, okay? Unlike carbonate. And so the oxygen isotopic composition of sulfate is the composition it had when that sulfate was created by weathering processes. It does not exchange oxygen with seawater. So the isotopic uh, concentration, uh, composition of oxygen in dissolved sulfate in the ocean bears no relationship to seawater, or no direct relationship. So the mass-independent fractionation of oxygen occurs, and this is actually what Mark Tiemens first demonstrated uh, in Bob Clayton's lab. <laughs> then had to reproduce it. I don't think Clayton was too happy about it. Uh, is that there's a strong fractionation when uh, in the stratosphere there are photochemical reactions that create ozone from oxygen. And the ozone becomes enriched in O17 and the oxygen is depleted. And a very important uh, side reaction is that uh, through a step reaction involving this uh, excited oxygen, the O1D molecule, uh, this excess in 17 bleeds off and is sequestered in CO2. And that allows the magnitude of the oxygen isotope anomaly to rise. So as a result, there are three things uh, which, as a geologist, uh, it's good to remember. First of all, is that the magnitude of this anomaly in oxygen, in atmospheric oxygen, increases with the CO2 O2 ratio, with this ratio. Okay, the more CO2 there is, the larger that anomaly is going to be. And this is and 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 most of that is because of the increase in CO2, not decrease in O2, because if O2 gets too low, then you're making there's so little of this reaction going on that you actually don't that, that, that uh, limits the, uh, uh, the creation of the fractionation. So it's largely an increase in CO2. Okay, secondly, uh, and this was the way this proxy, which you can measure in the modern atmosphere, this uh, depletion in O17, its original geological application or ecological application was as a, a, pro, a, a way of measuring global uh, biological productivity. Because the, the growth of the anomaly is limited by photosynthesis respiration. That's basically mixing and, and, and erasing the anomaly. Okay? And so that's what limits it. So that's how they originally thought they could use that as a way of, of estimating global productivity. So when I heard, first heard about this at Harvard in a talk given by Boaz Luce, 
my ears got really big because he's saying, oh yeah, and the anomaly gets bigger with rising with the more CO2 and is limited by photosynthesis respiration. And I'm saying, wow, this is the best snowball test that's ever been created because, of course, at the end of snowball, you have huge CO2 level and hardly any photosynthesis respiration. So the anomaly should be through the roof. If only I could get a sample of 635 million year old air. Okay. And what I didn't realize was that this anomaly in the atmosphere is transferred to sulfate when reactions convert sulfide into sulfate, dissolved sulfate, but not 100%. So it turns out, on average, of the four oxygen atoms in a sulfate ion, about one of them, on average, is from O2 in the air, and the other three are from H2O, rainwater. So you get about a quarter the magnitude of the atmosphere anomaly. But it's variable. It ranges from about 0.2 to 0.4. Okay, and that's the major uncertainty in trying to use the data I'm about to show to quantify how high the CO2 was. Okay, so the really good thing about uh, what Hui Ming Bao did is he established a good base level. You know, when that iridium spike was reported to the Cape T boundary, there was no background you know, of that age. And, but Hui Ming Bao really good. So here, this is sulfate, either uh, calcium sulfate or barium sulfate in, uh, in the modern, late Cenozoic, uh, late Paleozoic. Uh, never more than minus 0.2 per mil in sulfate. Cambrian a little, a little larger, down to minus 3. There are now data going back to 2 billion. And there, nothing is below minus 3 in a marine environment except this. That's the Maranoan cap. Well, this is the Maranoan cap, and this is the, these are these synglacial lakes in Svalbard that I showed you the photograph of with, the, with those lacustrian carbons with the heavy oxygen and, and no ice sheet. Okay. So the, the large ones are from South China, and this is a new data set uh, by Galen's uh, uh, and, and Boswing student Peter Crockford uh, from northwestern Canada, exactly the same as the ones in South China. Nice confirmation of that. And these are, are actually trace sulfate in those uh, glacial lake limestones. And note they go all the way down to minus 0.6 per mil. There's nothing at any other time in Earth history that looks like that. And so that's meaning high CO2 to O2 ratio and, and in combination with low photosynthesis respiration. And I've made that the same color because, of course, that's the difference between this and this. This is synglacial. This is syn deglacial. So at this time, there's already open water, because after all, the capdolomite is forming in open water, lots of wave-generated structures. No open water here. Or, you know, the lakes were seasonally, uh, or, you know, as they drained up under the ice sheet, like the Lake Vida and Lake Vanda and the McMurdo Dry Valley, they actually have uh, running water at the surface. Um, that difference is because there's no, proto, no uh, uh, photosynthesis respiration going on here, and you got lots here. Okay. And this was confirmed by Marcus Kunzmann uh, in his zinc isotope study. So zinc isotopes are a proxy for productivity, so you get a bloom in the modern ocean, and the zinc in the surface water gets heavy, okay, because light stuff is going down with the, with the export production, the sinking of organic matter. And in the upper half of the cap dolomite, there's a strong enrichment trend. Um, uh, this is in, uh, in uh, the Flinders Ranges. Um, that's that uh, uh, section at... Um, um, no, no, no. That, that's the one we didn't get to, actually. Um, uh, well, Pina Pound, that we didn't know the location of. My fault. Okay. Now, I don't know whether... Oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, can we do an, another one more isotope system? A completely different one? Okay, I, d I think I did uh, do this one. This is a sort of poignant tale. So, this is calcium isotopes. It's an isotopic system that's not uh, studied all that, uh, all that much, although Yuri uh, uh, Farkash is now in Australia, and he probably has done the most work of, of anyone. He's, I think, a protege of Don DePaulo at Berkeley. And so, here's the skinny. Um, Seawater calcium isotopes are about a, a one and a half per mil heavier than all the sources and sinks of carbonate. In other words, igneous rocks and, and limestone. 
sources and sinks. Uh, hydrothermal carbonate is a little bit heavier, but basically the inputs and the outputs are pretty much the same. So this is an equilibrium fractionation that's maintained by carbonate production. And it's very hard to change this very much. There's a lot of uh, subtle differences that are of biological origin. Um, but overall, the only way you can really shift the isotopic composition of seawater is to have an imbalance between the inputs and the outputs. And that normally doesn't occur, you know, because you increase the inputs, then, you know, you increase the output. I think we all know about that. You, you know, remember, uh, yeah. <laughs> I won't go into John Hutton. He's, he studied the circulation of blood in the digestive system, so we know about inputs and outputs. Okay, so, uh, but snowball earth, oh boy, that's real good. Because in snowball earth, due to acidification, you have these tens of millions of years when carbonate is dissolving, but no carbonate is being produced. Because the pH is going down, it's getting more and more and more acid. So all that carbonate that's going in is, is getting dissolved or surviving, but nothing is being deposited. I've never seen any primary carbonate in a, in a cryogenic glacial sequence within the cryocron yet, anywhere, including on the recent field trip. So that should mean that the composition of seawater should asymptote toward the input value over a few calcium residence times. I don't know what that was, but it's probably some millions of years. So that means there should be a big negative anomaly during the glaciation. Now, after the glaciation, the ocean's warming up, and uh, the pH is being driven up by silicate weathering, and so there's a lot more carbonate coming out of the ocean than there's coming in. There is carbonate coming in because, of course, it's raining down on carbonate platforms before sea level rise. So lots of, you know, uh, uh, carbonate weathering going on, but there's more coming out because the saturation is being driven higher by temperature change and pH change both rises. So that means you've got an excess of output over input, and that should drive the calcium isotopes heavy, so there's likely to be an overshoot. So this negative anomaly should be followed by a positive anomaly and then back, back to normal. Okay. It's a nice prediction. So here's uh, Juan Carlos Silva Tamayo's data plus uh, uh, data from Namibia by Simone Kasman. This is the cap dolomite. Notice that it's uh, normal and doesn't change, which is really good because that means there's no temperature dependence because this is when the temperature should, should have changed. And then as you go up section, you know, the gray bar here is the total range of, uh, of, uh, of, of phanerozoic variability, most of which is related to different skeletal organisms. There's the permatrastic boundary. Um, that's the analytical uncertainty. So as you go up into this flooding period, the high stand, which is after the ice is gone, but you're still drawing down the pH, you have a big negative anomaly followed by a positive anomaly. I've jimmied the sections together to make them fit. So Canada is 10 meters, Namibia is 100 meters. We've got, you know, we're in lower latitude, higher sedimentation, carbonate production rate. But it's exactly what Snowball Earth predicts. So why was this published in Precameron Research, you know, Precameron Research instead of Nature? Well, look where it occurs, where you see the anomaly. The ice is all, already gone, okay? And, and he, couldn't, he couldn't explain that. If it's sharp to chemistry, he was working uh, at Bairn with, um, who's the stabilized stop guy at Bairn? Name forget, forgive me, I've been in the field for almost three months now. Um, so <laughs> he couldn't explain that. And that's because he didn't think about the dynamics. Okay, so remember that this negative anomaly is in, is in the snowball water. The cap dolomite isn't produced from the snowball water, it's produced from the meltwater lid from Glacial Lake Harland. So that negative anomaly is going to be seen when this stable stratification finally breaks down and this snowball water mixes into the surface water and is expressed in carbonate for the first time. And so I think that what this represents is the time when the ocean stratification uh, finally breaks down and the ocean is mixed and that, and that snow, that evolved, chemically and isotopically evolved snowball water uh, can ex express itself in, in uh, shallow water carbonate. So I think this is a really good example of how the, the geochemistry and, uh, and the dynamics have to, uh, have to be considered together. And it's one of the jobs of geology is to get chemists and physicists to talk to each other. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can you then tell us something about the Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm all over it. So I used to, you know, I asked every physical oceanographer I ever met exactly that question. How long does it take to destratify the uh, post snowball ocean? And uh, you know, I won't <laughs> tell you all the people I talked to. Alan Robinson was probably the first, and I talked to Ellie Zipperman. He said ten thousand years. Now Dorian Abbott tells me I guess he's got someone working on it in Chicago he's, and presented a paper at AGU in the fall, and they're estimating 60,000 years. Okay, so yeah, I, I want to know exactly where that is, and that's why I put those figures in there so you can do the sum. So the sedimentation rates are, uh, are still very high, but you know, it could be a centimeter per year as opposed to centimeters per year. <clears throat> uh, there's an important thing here I probably won't get to mention. I have always been saying that this represents the deglaciation time scale, but Jessica Krubling's work with Jerry Mitrovica on the isostatic implications of snowball deglaciation uh, reveals very one important thing, and that is in a lot of coastal areas, you'll actually be in the peripheral bulge of an ice sheet, and so you're going to have subsidence on the time scale of the isostatic adjustment. And so that means you'll continue to have base level rise that will look like it might be glacio-eustatic, but it's actually going to be isostatic. And, and, and so that's operating on a time scale of, of, of uh, tens of thousands of years rather than uh, on the ice uh, disappearance time scale. So I, I need to relax uh, the sedimentation rates I was postulating for this part, uh, it, at least in, in certain areas. Okay. All right, so uh, cap carbonates, let, let's, uh, let's wrap this up before we uh, then turn to, I think, the most interesting challenge. <laughs> because biologists, you know, by and large, still don't really, they would like snowball to go away. <clears throat> and, and I got interested in it because I want, I, I'm afraid that, that, the, that my biological friends may get caught uh, lagging, and I think that would be a very bad thing. So I've, I've been working hard to, before I went to the field to try to think through how uh, life survived and prospered under these conditions uh, and, and, and get them inter interested, particularly the paleontologists. Uh, the biologists don't have so much of a problem, so we'll see. Okay, so cap garments are unique to cryogenic and glacial aftermaths, extent, scale, and style. Uh, the sturdy marinol ones are distinct, uh, and they're very useful for stratigraphy. They serve to distinguish their respective glacial sequences. Uh, although I have seen Marinon caps on sturdy and glacials, <laughs> it happens, you know. Uh, glaciers uh, both create and destroy local topography. And so that means that in detail, glacial stratigraphy is, is hideously complex. It's like uh, subaerial volcanic stratigraphy, if any of you are familiar with uh, subaerial volca uh, volcanic uh, uh, geology, Great Bear Magmatic Zone. Okay. Um, <laughs> Cap carbonates represent uh, re-precipitation of preglacial carbonate dissolved during the synglacial ocean acidification, augmented by uh, carbonate weathering uh, during as you as you melt the ice. Because initially sea level is low, so those tropical carbonate platforms are exposed to acid rain. Um, the Capdolo stone transgressive tracts, um, and they're poorly developed and sturdy, and although. Uh, the best one I've ever seen, as I mentioned, is at Dark Rula uh, in the Flinders Ranges. And we collected that for carbon isotopes with permission from, uh, from uh, Doug and March Sprig. Okay, capped also uh, precipitate and dolomitize in the meltwater dominated lid. You know, until I started thinking about, uh, you know, deglaciation rates and meltwater production and all this kind of, you know, airy fairy, you know, theoretical stuff. I was com thinking in completely the wrong way about, about cap dolomites. I just assumed they were marine, but I don't think they're marine at all. Okay. And, and I think that's... Oh, oh, I have more. Sorry. <laughs> oh, isotopes, yeah. Oh, did I kill it? Okay. Um, I, 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 that was a summary of the isotopes. You want that now, or you want to begin with that in the next session? Or do we really need these summaries? Can I skip them? Is everyone following?
Let's see if this one will come up. Yeah. Yeah, so the carbon isotope composition uh, actually re you know, reflects both the outgas CO2, so it's heavier than modern CO2, because you know, mantle CO2 is minus six, it's not you know, minus eight and a half like the atmosphere. So the atmosphere carbon actually gets quite heavy, uh, plus the dissolved carbonate, that, that's a huge component of the DIC. Uh, yeah, CO2 uh, rich atmosphere from the uh, uh, cap delta 17. Boron isotopes I didn't talk about. Uh, zinc isotopes indicate rapid resumption of organic port export production. Uh, and that's also consistent with the, uh, the rapid uh, elimination of, the, uh, of this uh, mass independent oxygen isotope anomaly. Peter Crawford showed that. And uh, oh, yeah, strontium, yeah, so strontium isotopes, that, I should say something about that. Uh, I had really strong resistance about snowball earth from most radiogenic isotope geologists. And, and it was because of the strontium isotopes. Because you don't really see a change in strontium isotope composition from preglacial to postglacial carbonate. And most people took the uh, composition of, the, say, the cap carbonate, not the cap dolomite, because there's not enough strontium to measure in dolomite, but in the overlying limestones, as, as, uh, uh, as recorders of the glacial ocean. And what they were saying was that in snowball, it should get very non radiogenic. Because you have very, you know, continental weathering is reduced, but hydrothermal exchange is, if anything, getting stronger. So you should really go down to mantle like strontium isotopes, and you don't observe that. Okay? And, and so the, the two things you need to remember is first of all, there is no direct record of strontium isotopes in the glacial ocean because no carbonate was being produced in the glacial ocean because of the ocean acidification. Carbonate was only dissolving. And what the, state, what the strontium and osmium isotopes show in the cap carbonate is that you have this intense weathering uh, and that's making the, the, the cap carbonate highly radiogenic. In fact, it's already uh, getting less radiogenic as you go up section. So it's way too late in the game and it's sampling the meltwater lid, not the snowball ocean. And so uh, those post-glacial carbonates are really not a proxy for the glacial ocean. At this point, we really don't know what the isotopic composition of the glacial ocean was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think the best way to think about it is that it's a combination of three factors. Okay, the first, which may, maybe I've talked too much about, is the CO2 concentration. So there's some threshold in the CO2 uh, that is required to initiate deglaciation under given conditions. Now, the given conditions, there are at least two other things that are important. One is how much dust there is. Because okay? dust is a major net absorber or warmer absorber of outgoing infrared radiation under snowball condition. In the modern climate, dust is not all that important because like clouds, it scatters sunlight, so it makes it a bit cooler in the daytime, but it absorbs infrared at night and makes it a bit warmer, and those effects cancel. But you can't see dust or clouds when they're above ice. And that shows that they're not doing anything, to the, uh, uh, anything new uh, to the albedo, but they are increasing the absorption. So the dustier it is, uh, then the lower the CO2 level will be that is required to, change the, to, to trigger the deglaciation. Presumably these other things are maybe not changing so much. Depends on how big the ice, ice sheets are. If they're getting smaller and smaller, the dust actually may be getting uh, more and more. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing that's, that's hugely important is the surface albedo. Okay, that's the other major factor that controls the deglaciation point uh, in nature and in models is what the surface albedo is. And of course, most critically, what the albedo is at the equator. Because that's where the deglaciation, at least of the ocean, is going to begin. And really what I mean by snowball deglacing, I'm talking about the collapse of the tropical sea glacier. You're starting to open up the ocean. There may be large areas of land that's ice-free. It's still a snowball if the ocean is frozen. And, and I think you go very fast from, from no open water, aside from cracks, to you know, uh, a lot of open water. I think that occurs very quickly. 
So th those are the three factors, CO2, dust, and uh, el surface albedo. And surface albedo is going to be, that's, I'm going to th that's going to be a huge factor in the biology part. Because that also controls the tropical uh, ice thickness. Yeah? What do you see as being the process by which CO2 concentrates to such an extent that you trigger the deglaciation? That there, there are few, if any, there are very few sinks. So the only significant sink for carbon dioxide is seafloor weathering. That will continue. It'll be slow because the water is very cold, but it'll speed up as the, as the water gets more acidic. But that's the only... Uh, continental weathering, there'll be some because uh, continental material will come into the ocean as, uh, uh, as suspended matter, and that will uh, tend to react. So there will be some, but it will, be, will not be any, anything like uh, today. Uh, organic productivity, which is about 20% of carbon burial in the world today, will be extremely limited. But remember rates, because it's going to turn out that organic burial is uh, going to be a huge driver in snowballers, even though the productivity is low. And it's because of the time scale. Geologists, geologists never forget time scale. Yeah. And you, Just a quick question. Yeah. What sort of rate of rise of CO2 do you predict in terms of yeah, that, you know, people just assume the, pr the present because Neoproterozoic, the mean mantle temperature probably wasn't uh, very much different than the present. Um, the continental uh, degassing will be a little bit less because of the ice, the oceanic a little bit more because of less water, because of the pressure effects. I think most people just say about the same as, as present. And so the estimates were that depending on, on the sink term, that's the big uncertainty, you know, uh, millions to tens of millions of years required to reach a tenth of a bar. That was sort of the ballpark estimates. And I think the, uh, Guillaume Lahir, uh, the same guy who did uh, that modeling of the ice sheets, uh, he earlier did geochemical modeling, probably uh, has done the best work on, on, on exactly that question, the rise of... Uh, of CO2 and its rate in the ocean and in the atmosphere. And another a French guy, Sébastien Fabre, has done currently the best work on the, from a theoretical and experimental standpoint on the deglaciation and the cap carbonates. So the, the French have really been, uh, you know, they've stolen a lead, actually, from the theoretical standpoint. Yeah, um, and I'm sorry to digress a little bit, but it was during this time when you have one of the largest island arc complexes forming and colliding in the Arabian Nubian Shield. Um, do you have any comment on what the formation of this, this very large juvenile arc system would have had yeah. on, on Snowboard? Yeah. Well, I guess most of it, if I remember the, uh, you know, the igneous uh, ages, it most of it was a little bit, well, it would overlap with the early part of the... Uh, 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 the Sturdian, at least. Uh, I guess my main concern, uh, putting my tectonics hat on, is that I don't know that the Pan-African, uh, the Arabian Nubian Shield is such a huge uh, uh, production of, of juvenile continental crust uh, on a global scale. It's just that it's all in one place. But that tends to happen. I call those tectonic parking lots. Uh, some people call them tectonic graveyards, but they, they're not there forever. They park there for a while. So just like the Altaids, which is the main tectonic graveyard uh, in the Pale uh, Paleozoic juvenile crust, or uh, Alaska, the main tectonic graveyard for, for Mesozoic, Cenozoic juvenile crust. Uh, the, the estimates that I remember that were done by Jerry Schubert suggested a million cubic, uh, uh, a, a million cubic meters per year of production, which is about equal to the global ridge system, which I don't think is... Un un unusual so on a global scale. With things like then the Franklin, well, the thing about the Franklin is that it's, it's, an, it's the coincidence in age. It's, it's hard not... Now, we wish that the... the so these are all badly eyed ages. And there are te technical... And they span, you know, 20 years back to all work by Larry Heeman. And, and so there are technical issues uh, about, uh, about badly eyed dates. And the ages for the Franklin lip 
uh, currently uh, go from 720, if you take the errors, uh, from about 728 to 712. There's actually a, a very large range. The most recent uh, uh, dates uh, were the ones down in Mount Harper and from one of the Gabbro Sills on uh, Victoria Island in the, in, the, in the central area. And they were actually very tight around 716, 717, but they're all from the top of the lava pile. Uh, so we'd like to know more about the, uh, about the duration. But as it stands now, the top of the lava pile is more or less coincident with the glacial uh, onset. And, and so that's why it has suddenly uh, uh, risen as a potential proximal trigger, not, not just a more distal condition that made the Earth more susceptible, but the actual trigger. And, and so the, I, I think the interesting uh, discussion right now is whether it's the weathering of the Franklin Large Igneous Province, because it's sitting right on the equator, actually on an east-facing continental margin. So it's ideally situated for intense weathering. So that would be the aftermath of the lip. Or is it the volcanic activity itself? Now, this whole business about the sulfate as stratospheric aerosol comes from a paper that's probably out now uh, in EPSL by Laurie Glaze, uh, a student with uh, Steve Self, a volcanologist in, in Britain. And what they have shown is, uh, you know, you always think of basalt as being very sort of quiescent type eruptions. So how would you ever inject into the stratosphere? You need to do that, because sulfate aerosol in the troposphere rains out very quickly. So you need to get into stratosphere where it has much longer residence time. And then it scatters sunlight and makes it colder. And so it turns out that fissure eruptions, uh, which create fire fountains that they always take pictures of and you know, TV stuff, uh, make thermal plumes that are long lasting, can last for 100 years or more. And they're actually, according to models, very effective in injecting uh, aerosol into the stratosphere. And because the Franklin Large Igneous Province is, is in place through the Shaler Group, which has all these sulfate evaporites, uh, it's very likely that there was a lot of, of sulfate aerosol. So uh, I think the, the, you know, the most interesting new idea as the trigger for the Sturdian is a direct volcanic forcing. 